So I want to talk to you today about the heavens declaring the glory of God. Let me read to you a scripture. And this is talking about the end, but you'll see the relevance as we read it. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8, and I'm reading from the Good News Version 1611. Unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, that was a joke by the way, in case you didn't realise it, O God, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hebrews 1 verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Then it says, they shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's talking about the end. And you're going to see its relevance as I progress. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, I believe very strongly that we need to keep to a six-day creation as believers, not because I believe that it's immediately a salvation issue. It isn't, and that would be going too strong to say that. But because the scriptures say in Genesis 1, evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, day two, day three, day four, It's actually even more detailed than that, but that's not my primary purpose this morning because I want to talk about the heavens declaring the glory of God. But I just want to lay it down there such that you know where I'm coming from. I believe very strongly that it's exactly as the Lord says. There is no messing here. It's because of the evening and morning. If he hadn't used the term evening and morning, possibly it wouldn't have been utterly clear. But it is clear when he uses the term evening and morning. Everywhere else where the Hebrew word yom is used with evening or with morning or with both, as happens, for instance, in 1 Samuel 17, where we read that Goliath came before the army of Israel both in the evening and the morning for 40 million years. No. For 40,000 years, for 40 weeks? No, it says for 40 days because the evening and morning immediately tells you it's an ordinary solar day. That's just one example, but there are plenty of examples running all the way through the Hebrew scriptures where evening and morning with the word yom, without fail, always means an ordinary solar day. Well, you say, And this is often the problem. Oh, by the way, if you really want a key verse which actually shows to you it has to be six ordinary days, it's in Exodus 20, verse 11, where it says, even if we don't take a Sabbatarian view today, that's a different issue, but certainly the Jews were being told very specifically that they had to keep a Sabbath, right? Whatever one's view today, that's immaterial. The Jews were being told in Exodus 20 that they were to remember the Sabbath day, which for them was the Saturday. Why? Because in six days the Lord made, and it says here, the heavens, which we're going to be talking about, and the earth, the sea and all that is uh, is in, is in them, and rested the seventh day. There's just no way around this. It is absolutely clear that the Lord is saying you are to keep the seventh 24-hour day because I made the heavens, the earth, the sea, everything, all in six days. There's just no argument. God is declaring what he did. And he wrote that with his finger. Let us never forget that. There are interesting examples, which I'll leave you to go through the scriptures, where the Lord used his finger and wrote. One notable one, of course, is in Daniel. And you can find another one where the Lord wrote on the sand. And we don't know what he wrote. But 
people have a problem with this. I've just picked out a question. That's why it says question two here, because I normally deal with a number of questions. But people do have a question. How on earth can you say that the sun, moon, and stars were all made on the fourth day? What about the light? That's not a big issue. People make much too big an issue of this. The question then, if I want to put it very specifically, is how can you have the day and night made before the sun? The Lord doesn't need the sun to produce light. Do you think that he's limited by his own creation? Of course not. We're thinking of when the Lord Jesus comes. We're going through, you'll go through the advent ring here. And you'll come to the glorious day when the Lord, I don't know whether this will be one of the candles, but the Lord will announce to the shepherds, you know, that, and he'll have the glory of God shining, right, to the shepherds and they go to Bethlehem. Well, what was that glory in the sky? It certainly wasn't the moon, neither was it the sun, neither was it the stars, it was the glory of God, it, probably the Shekinah glory. And we don't know exactly what that light was on the first three days. It doesn't tell us explicitly. But it could well have been the, the, the glory of the Lord Jesus himself. Because if we were to read two chapters on, or was it one? No, two chapters on from what Andrew read. You have Revelation 21 verse 23 where it says there's no need for the sun in that place, that glorious place that we're, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ are going to because the Lamb is the light of that place. Isn't that glorious? Right? And so, you know, I don't know all the answers. Please don't think I do. But I do know this, that the Lord does not need the sun to have light. So it may have been, I don't know for sure, that God was shining on the rotating globe, and although I'm quoting 1 John 1 here, clearly that is primarily spiritual, but it could be physical because the Lord shone on the Mount of Transfiguration. So it could have been the Lord's own glory shining on a rotating globe. And then day four, the sun, moon and stars took over. Okay? So don't get hung up by that. If you take the scriptures... It just exactly as they are written. You don't need to be get, finding tortuous pathways to say, oh, well, maybe, you know, the stars were hidden. I won't say who it is, but some people have said that, that the stars were hidden and then they sort of materialised on the fourth day. No, no, no. Just take what it says in Genesis 1. And, of course, we are living here in days when... Not only the world, but sadly, other people who are within the church who perhaps should know better are trying to teach us that we cannot take the scriptures in a straightforward way. And I want to suggest to you that we can, sorry, ignore that slide. Uh, I want to suggest to you that actually we can indeed take exactly what the scriptures say concerning the creation week. So I've just summarized it here, that the Lord created light on the first day. On the second day, he created the expanse and the firmament. And on day three, he created the lands, flowers and trees. And on day four that I've just mentioned, we've got the greatest understatement in the scriptures where it says, he made the stars also. And I could just consider that for a few moments but let me just remind you that on day one, the first recorded instance of creation is this wonderful statement by God, let there be light. And it says, I take it to mean um, a sort of heading in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Some people get hung up by verse 1. That is, if you like, a title. It's saying, I'm going to explain to you in more detail in the following verses, but this is a summary of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not saying that there was an earlier heaven. That's not the way I take it. And many of us don't take it that way. We just simply say that this is a summary. Then it goes on in verse 2, following all the way down to verse 31 
to say what happened. And God presumably had a, a globe of water because that's all that's referred to, that the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. So God started with water, it would seem. Then he says in verse 3, let there be light. And now my conviction is, I can't quite prove this, that he made electromagnetic radiation. I think actually it was the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. I mentioned that last night. And God saw the light, that it was good. And that must have been very, very striking because God had made the fundamental element, as it were, well, it's not really an element, it's really to do with the forces of nature, but actually all matter needs electromagnetism to exist. But he made light in especially, as we were just saying earlier, the light was shining. But then verse 2, it says, oh, sorry, day 2, God said, let there be in verse 6, this is where the old version doesn't get it right. It uses the word firmament, which is a sort of a Latin word meaning a dome, and it's not a dome. And this is where other translations are better, when they say, let there be an expanse, right? Because the Hebrew word here is rachia, which simply means an expanse. Let there be an expanse. Now, this is very interesting. Let there be an expanse. What's the expanse? Well, it says, in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. The waters below, from the waters above. Now, you might think immediately, oh, well, it just means the clouds and the sky. No, it doesn't. Because it goes on to say in verse 8, that God called the expanse heaven. And then it says a bit later in verse 15, talking about the stars being made on the fourth day, let them be for lights in the expanse. Well, the stars are not in the clouds, are they? Not in the sky, just sort of, just, just a few sort of thousand feet up. No, 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 that's ridiculous. So, conclusion, and it's a very important deduction. Let there be an expanse. Is God saying, let there be space? Get it, guys? Our God is great. What this is saying is that God made space. And when you, get, you begin to get your mind around this, this is utterly amazing. This is mind-boggling. Because God made the whole of space in which he was going to put the stars. And we're going to find out that this is a huge, 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 gigantic expanse. What he did on day four is something utterly mind-boggling on day two. So God divided the waters above, conclusion, waters on the edge of the universe, Heard of the cosmic background radiation? Some people, from the creation perspective, suggest that actually that cosmic background radiation is a relic. Well, not a relic. It's actually something very significant, which is to do with the water on the edge of the universe, which God made. And indeed, there is evidence that there is water out there. Recently, there's been findings which suggest that. And, of course, the water below is the globe of water. You're beginning to get it. This is what the scripture is saying. I'm not, I'm not saying anything more than, than what's in the scripture. You can see the verses are telling you this, okay? So now, we come then to the sun, moon, and stars, which, of course, are made on day four. Let's just... Before we sort of come back to that point, I am going to come back to it because it's actually hugely instructive. Let's just remind ourselves then that the stars and the bodies, the heavenly bodies, were made on the fourth day of the creation week. And Psalm 19, which of course 
we we effectively sang earlier because that we had a song which was uh, yes god is good which was talking about the greatness of what god had done and they declare psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of god psalm 8 says that the stars are the work of his fingers and by the way contrasts isaiah 59 which says that our salvation let us never forget this our salvation took God's extended arm to bring salvation. That was a mighty work of God. It was nothing to God to make the stars. That's why he says he made the stars also, which is uh, such an understatement. Each star, though, is named. Psalm 147, verse 4 says, and also Isaiah 40, verse 26, that he knows all the stars by name. Yes, he knows Orion, he knows the Pleiades. Yes, he knows all the major stars, but he knows all the stars which we've only recently begun to discover. Now, I just want to actually put some flesh on the bones of this fact that he knows all the stars by name. How, first of all, I need to just use a different ruler to measure the distances which we're now going to be considering because we're going to be considering some huge numbers, right? So we need to actually define a new way of measuring uh, distance and we're going to be dealing with large numbers of stars very shortly. But just to get some idea as to the size of the universe, um, we're going to deal first of all with a light second which is the distance travelled by light travelling at the speed that we know of. Remember I said some of you were here last night. We don't know utterly for sure that light is necessarily travelling always in deep space at the same speed. But let's just part that point. We're just using this as a measure of distance. If we suppose that light travel is constant at, uh, at 300,000 kilometres per second, then uh, clearly a light second then is 300,000 kilometres. Um, as a three, yeah. So that is approximately seven times round the Earth. So a light minute is 18 million kilometres and a, the distance to the sun is about 8.3 light minutes and so on and so forth. And eventually we get to the point of needing to use light years where the numbers just get so big you can barely comprehend what it is but 10 trillion kilometers is a light year and we've only just begun because we're going to be dealing with much greater distances than that in terms of light hours just mention that here that is the distance that light travels in a year. The solar system is about 10 light hours across, which is why when we're trying to, or NASA's trying to control the, uh, the uh, automatic robots which are going on as Mars rovers, it takes a considerable number of minutes to actually get that signal to Mars and they have to program what it's going to do for the whole day and basically say, here guys, this is your menu for today because they can't control it in real time. Well, we could go on, we could talk about the size of some of these things, but I'm just going to actually talk about the size of the universe. Let me just give you some understanding where the solar system, which I've just mentioned, is in the Milky Way. By the way, I don't know whether you've ever had the chance to see the Milky Way at night. Probably down here, you get a better view of the stars on a clear night. But uh, the only way I could really see the stars in their glory was to go into the North York Moors and go on a beautiful winter's evening where you wrap up and you could see the stars in their glory. Uh, and it really is a sight for sore eyes. The other time when I saw the stars in a very clear way, was when we went down the Grand Canyon and it was so warm, we didn't sleep under a tent at night. I spent most of my night just lying under the stars each, each night, watching the Milky Way inch its way over the sky. And it was an utterly glorious sight. 
this Milky Way, that's just one arm of it, um, if Andrew was, Andrew Chappell was, uh, you know, if we sent him out in the Sputnik, you know, to look at the Milky Way head on, you know, that's what he would see. I don't think anybody's ever seen it, not yet, like that. But that's what we think it would look like. And it's 100,000 light years across. <laughs> this is getting rather large. In other words, light at its present speed would take that amount of time to cross it. Such are the distances involved. And in case you're wondering where you are, there, you're there. <laughs> you are here. <laughs> well, that's where the solar system is. And in fact, Einstein made the comment once, it is quite remarkable that we are in that location because we're not so close to what's reckoned to be a black hole in the middle, um, but not just a black hole, but where there's a huge number of stars where basically you wouldn't have black at night. Neither are we so far away that you wouldn't be aware of the other stars. We're aware of the other stars, but we're not too close, neither are we too far away. And of course, within the solar system, I'm not dealing with that particularly just at this point, but the Earth, of course, is just the right distance from the sun, what we call the Goldilocks zone, where you can get water in both water, ice and water vapour all together. That's, that's very difficult to get. Most other planets that they found circling other stars are not in those crucial locations. So now, uh, let's now try and estimate what are the number of stars. You see, Abraham was told in Genesis 15 verse 5, tell the stars if you're able to number them. <laughs> well, this gets interesting. Because yes, it's true that he could have seen probably about 3,000 stars. But the Lord wasn't saying that his descendants were just going to be 3,000. A six-inch telescope would see about 30,000 stars. He didn't have one, I presume. A large professional telescope would see about 200,000 million stars in the Milky Way alone. That, in case if you're used to this, you know, and you do numbers just to get yourself to sleep, you count. Do you count sheep or do you count stars? Whatever you do. Anyway, it, it's 200 billion or 2 times 10 raised to the power 11. So we're just counting the stars in the Milky Way. If we were to count three stars per second after 100 years, you would have counted less than 5% of the Milky Way galaxy alone. So let's count a bit faster. If we counted at 3 million stars per second, it would take 18 and a half hours to count all the 200 billion Milky Way stars. But the Milky Way is but one of billions of galaxies. Yes, billions of galaxies. This was found by Hubble, uh, quite a number of decades ago now, but he suddenly realised that when he was actually looking at some stars which looked like clouds, actually that they were other galaxies full of their own stars, if you please. And suddenly people became aware of, aye, we haven't just got one galaxy, we've got other galaxies out there. And of course we're very familiar that, with that these days. So, um, just to give you some idea, as to how many galaxies there are, this particular picture is taken with what's called the Hubble Deep Field Telescope, which rotates round the globe, and eventually it's going to come to the end of its life. I think it's getting there now. But this is what the Hubble Telescope sees through a basic... <laughs> it's difficult to get this over, but to give you some idea what it's doing, if you have a sheet of paper out there, an A4 sheet, and you have a one millimetre times one millimetre square, and you hold it at one metre away from you, that's what you're looking through there. That's just one part of the sky. And you can see here that there is a galaxy there, there's a galaxy there, there is a galaxy there, there is a galaxy there, a galaxy, galaxies everywhere. 
In other words, there's a lot of galaxies. So we've got to do some maths. So what's the total number of galaxies? Well, it's estimated that if there's that number in what we just saw, you can perhaps estimate how many galaxies there are right round the whole of the 360 degrees that way and the 360 degrees that way. And basically, it's a lot, OK? Over 2 million have actually been counted, but there could be 100,000 million galaxies, which is 100 billion. In other words, 10 to the 11. So if you're trying to get to sleep at night, you try doing this. Multiply 2 times 10 to the 11, which we reckon is the number of stars. Got it? You're with me, David, aren't you? You haven't gone to sleep yet. Do you want to get the ice cream? You, you, just, just by getting there. Right, go. Okay, get out your calculator. 2 times 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 11. Well, you know what you do with indices? You, you know this. If you need some maths tuition, my wife's a maths tutor. So, so you add the indices, right? The 10 to the 11 is, the 11 is added to the other 11. Isn't that right, David? Is that what they taught you at Bridge End? Yeah, so... So it's actually, would you believe it, it's, well, it's just the mind boggles. It's 2 times 10 to the 22. Well, these numbers are getting so gigantic. You need a computer to help you, but the computers don't help you very much because if we're counting at 3 million per second, it would take 211 million years to count all the stars. Well, let's up it to 10 million per second. Well, it would still take 63 million years to count all the stars. Is our God a great God? That's what I'm seeking to show you. Psalm 147 verse 4 says that he knows all the 2 times 10 to the 22 stars by name. That's the God that we're dealing with. So now... The stars, I said, are the work of his fingers. Each star is named. Now consider, I'm coming back to the issue that I said I would come back to, because I don't want to keep you here all afternoon as well as the morning. You realise you're here till after lunch, you know, you're all having lunch here, right? God made the firmament, the expanse, which is really a better term, on day two. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. This is the word raka that I mentioned. Now, if you look in verse 14, it says, let there be lights in the raka of the heaven. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven. So, let's... Just really get this scripture into our minds because it's not the only place, as we're going to see, that we get reference to these stars in the Racha. And the heavens is the word Shamayim. Don't, don't feel that you have to remember, seriously, I'm not joking here. I'm not saying that you should necessarily be an expert. I'm not an expert of the Hebrew. I just read those who are experts in the Hebrew, right? But it's very interesting that God is not... He's not just put these words in a glib way. He's put these words for us to study and to understand so that we might grasp his greatness, Right? And I'm just taking the scriptures as they say, let there be lights in the raka of the Samayim, which is the heaven. Now, you know that Paul talked about the third heaven, which implies that there are three heavens, which there are. There is the heaven, which if you read Genesis 1, it talks about the, the flying creatures flying on the face of the heaven, which is, of course... They're flying in the sky, which is the atmosphere. You can see this when you go into space. Juliet won't let me go into space, so I'm not going to apply to Pesos to go up. But, you know, I'd love to actually see it from space, but she won't let me go to Antarctica. She won't let me go into space, so I suppose I've had it. But, I, you know, I'd love to have a look. She's great. But, uh, but when 
when you see these pictures, you see the atmosphere. That is the first heaven. The second heaven is what we're talking about, where God put the stars. The third heaven is where God dwells. And that's what Paul was taken up to. That's what, it all fits when you think of it like this. Now, you see, if God made the space, which, by the way, he doesn't say was good, because, frankly, there was nothing to sort of see, but it was very important. He made the he made the expanse. It doesn't mean it wasn't good. It's just that it's not referred to in the series of things which are good. That's not to say it wasn't good. But as soon as you put the stars in, of course it's good, because you can see, you can see the glory. Now, we had a question last night as to how on earth does the light come from such distant places into, and it must have come, how he did it, we're not quite sure, and we have no real grasp on this. But I'm going to suggest to you something from other verses now, which I think will just give us a clue as to what may well have been happening. And these are verses concerning what the scriptures say about how these stars are placed in the Raqqa, and then also what's going to happen at the end. First of all, let me just say that these heavenly bodies were not put randomly. They are for signs and for seasons. Remember we read that in Genesis 1? And how is it, isn't it wonderful how it says in Job chapter 38, where God is saying how great he is, right? Not in a sort of uh, selfish way. That's not the way God works. Because God would have us worship him because that is the secret to our well-being. We should be worshipping him. We should be giving glory to him. And Job, even though he was greatly suffering, God did have a few words with Job. And he said, are you able to bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades? Which, by the way, you can see in the night sky if you look um, not too far away. Uh, from uh, Cassiopeia, you'll actually see the Pleiades. And then Orion, which is one of the great big constellations which is moving around the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. You can always make out what looks like the man in the sky with the band and the sword hanging down. And can you, uh, can you loose the bands of Orion? And it's been observed that the Pleiades are actually hanging together by something that people don't understand what it is. They seem to be sort of held together. And he's referring to it here. One star differs from another star in glory, the Apostle Paul says. Amos says, seek him that makes the seven stars and Orion and turns the shadow of death into the morning. We should actually give God the glory for the stars. But now let me tell you something else. Did you know that there are at least 11 occasions all the way through Isaiah, Jeremiah, right up to Zechariah, which says God stretched the heavens? Now, this is getting very interesting. God stretched the heavens. This is the Samayim. This is another way of referring to the Raka. He stretched them out. I have made the earth, created man upon it. Even my hands have stretched out the hen heavens and all their host have I commanded. That is the stars. The stretching of the heavens is referred to in Isaiah 40, verse 22. It's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12. It's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 15. I'll put these scriptures up in a moment. So all these scriptures are referring to God stretching the heavens. Now, this is a very fascinating point. Because, because people have observed that most of the galaxies are what we call redshifted. They are moving away from us. And they have suggested that it seems that there is an expansion going on in the universe. And indeed, I think they're correct. There is an expansion going on. But of course, they maintain 
that it was a Big Bang billions of years ago, 13.1, 13.2 billion years ago. I don't think that for a moment. God made the stars on the fourth day and then he pushed them out in an ordered expansion, which is being referred to repeatedly through the scriptures. Now, if it just happened once in the prophets, you'd say, well, that's just picture language. But because it's actually being referred to time and time and time again, and the last time when I counted, it was actually 11 times that it actually refers to stretching out the heavens. I think that's all of them there. So if you're writing it down or you can have the copy of the slides later, that's up to you. Yeah, but do you see what I'm saying here? That God is telling us that he stretched out space. I'm not talking about the stars themselves. But now we come to a very interesting concept. Isaiah chapter 34. I'll bring it up on the slides in a minute, but you might like to turn to it because this is an amazing psalm, uh, amazing verse. Isaiah 34, verse 4. I'm leaving those up there because I know some of you are taking notes and I don't want to make life too hard for you. As it is, you're going to miss lunch anyway. So, <laughs> no, you're not. I'm just, uh, <laughs> just keeping your attention, I hope. Now, look at this. This is now beginning to talk about the end. One of the best ways of understanding the universe is to see what's going to happen at the end. And if you think it took millions of years to make the universe, it ain't going to take millions of years to close it down, guys. And in fact, when you look at the end, it gives you the clue as to God's authority at the beginning. God didn't take millions of years to make the universe. There, ain't, there hasn't been billions of years. He didn't take millions of years to make the earth either. It's not my purpose primarily here, but just to give you a tidbit so that you can actually think about it, it didn't take millions of years to make those fossils which are found in the rocks all the sedimentary rock down here in Cornwall and in Devon and right across the UK was formed in one year primarily at the flood. That's what the Bible is really telling us, right? And the basement rock, even that one, didn't take millions of years either. So now look at Isaiah 34 verse 4. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together like as a scroll, and all their host shall be, shall fall down. I'm trying to do a scroll, right? He's going to roll up the heavens like a scroll. In other words, from God's point of view, he's God. He, I'm not God. Who is? None of us are like him, are we? Nobody could be compared to God, but from his perspective, he looks upon the stars in the, in the expanse. And this is not the only place where he says this. Like a scroll. You can pull a scroll and everything comes with it. You can pull a curtain and everything comes with it. And he uses the, these analogies in other places, Isaiah 34, verse 4, right? I've likened it there to a scroll, so you get the sense that from his perspective, the whole of Andromeda, which all, with, all its, uh, with all its constituent to 10 to the 11 stars, is nothing to him. He can just pull them down in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And Matthew 24, verse 4 tells, t tells me, not verse 4, Matthew 24 tells me, that the stars will fall from heaven. Do you get it? The Lord is in control. It says in Hebrews 1 verse 3, everything is supported by the word of his power. When the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, was dying on the cross at his apparent weakness, and only apparent, 
He was controlling all the whole universe still as the Son of God. Colossians 1 says, by him all things consist. And it gets me, my mind boggles when I consider the cross. Because it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The world mocks this. But in fact, the one who controls all things, and by the way, he controls the climate as well. The flood, the worldwide flood proves that. And people forget this in the church, that there has been a massive climate disaster just four and a half thousand years ago. Once you get that in your mind, you begin to look in a different way at so-called climate science. You see, when you grasp that the whole of the universe is under the control by delegated authority, Psalm 110, everything is given to the Son to be under his authority, right? The Lord Jesus Christ has everything under his control, including the stars. Now, when you get that in your mind, you no longer follow the Lawrence Krauses of this world who say you are just stardust. And the stars died that you might be here today, he famously said, mocking the Christian gospel. You forget the Richard Dawkins of this world. You forget the Brian Coxes strutting around as though they knew everything, but they don't. Because they haven't grasped that the Lord made the stars, he made the galaxies, and he placed them even in something else that they assume that they can have, but itself is made as well. Space is a creation of God. And we don't realise that, friends. You think that expanse is just empty space. It's not. There is evidence that even empty deep space has something in it that the physicists don't understand. There seems to be some sort of charges in it. Maxwell showed this. That that's why they began to call it in the 1800s ether. Because I'm not saying, by the way, that we fully understood it now. We haven't. But there seems to be something in space. That's what the physicists have concluded. And so they talk about space-time continuum, which is really another word for ether. But they don't like to use the word ether because they say that was discredited in the 1800s. Actually, everything suggests that space itself is an entity, that God made it. And as he says, he placed the stars in space. Now we come to Psalm 102. I told you you'd be here for tea as well. Um, Psalm 102, I'm almost through, seriously, in case Andrew's going to throw me out. Um, Psalm 102 says this, and it's quoted, of course, in Hebrews 1, which I read. So turn with me to Psalm 102. It's just utterly wonderful. Verse 24, I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. The years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Now, this brings me to a very important point. I said this, I think, was it to one of the young people last night when we were talking about starlight. You either have an infinite universe, which is what most people in the secular world believe in, or else you have an infinite God, thy years shall not fail, right? thy years shall have no end, and a gigantic but finite universe. And that's what the scriptures are actually teaching. The universe, although it's huge, has an edge, right? And God can grasp it like a garment. 
Psalm 102 says he's going to fold it up. He's going to fold it up. And it's like Isaiah 34, it's the same thought. It's going to be folded up. And we read in Hebrews chapter 1, that wonderful book. I oft, I'm never quite sure who's written it, but I tend to think it's the Apostle Paul because it's so full of uh, very, very precise reasoning. And then he talks about chains at the end of Hebrews. But it says here, quoting Psalm 102, verse 11, Hebrews 1, They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as a doth the garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Matthew 24, verse 29, also talks about the stars falling from heaven. So, look, friends, what we're really seeing here, as I'm just putting up the scriptures so that you can see them, that when it comes to the end, the stars are going to be pulled down in a moment. It won't take billions of years. And they're going to, everything's going to be folded up. Now do you see that when we actually now get this in perspective, when we see that the universe is going to be folded up, then we see that the final judgment is going to be exceedingly quick when the Lord returns. And the world is not ready. And the danger is that the church, Matthew 25, five foolish virgins, five wise virgins, the danger is that we will not be ready because we'll be caught up with the Greta Thunbergs and the Attenboroughs of this world trying to tell us, you know, that there's some other ending that we can control. And in fact, it's the Lord who's in control, right? We need to be very careful that we don't get caught up with the scheme of this world. It says in another place in 1 Corinthians 7 that the fashion of this world or the schema of this world is passing away. And I wonder whether you today are getting caught up with the fashion of this world. We need to be separate to the world. We need to have our minds on Christ. We need to have our minds on him. We need to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to be looking to Christ's return. We need to be looking back to the cross, which we've just done in the communion service. We need to be thanking him for who he is. He is the great son of the almighty God under whose authority all things have been placed. And then it will be that he himself will say, Father, everything is now ready. And at the Father's command, Christ will return. Wow, what a day it will be. Christ upholds all things by the word of his power and he is going to consummate or all things are going to be consummated, I should say, in Christ. I always wonder if I go first, and I almost went this year. I was very ill in March and April. Um, and I think Juliet was probably meditating on what to put on my epitaph, frankly. But I, well, it was quite serious. And, but, you know, I, I wonder whether I should have Colossians 1.18 which in all things he might have the preeminence. Or this verse, Romans 11, verse 36. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. I love that verse as well. I don't know what to, to say. But I do know this, that the greatest thing of all is that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning. And we don't know quite what was happening. But if you're going to ask me about the star at Bethlehem, I do not know what that star is. So please don't ask me some pretty difficult questions about the Christmas star. But I, do, I, I really don't know the answer because it was a star that moved. And I don't know how that works. But the Lord, maybe it was a supernatural light that the Lord brought. But uh, I'm just referring it to here. Some have suggested it might have been Jupiter in retrograde motion. I'm not sure that that's correct. I now think a bit differently to that. I think it's got to be something which is most supernatural. But look, what I do want to also bring your attention to is that something remarkable happened at the cross. And I'm going to end on this. I love to end on the gospel. I really do. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he put out the sun. 
as if to say, you who think that you can control the universe, I'm going to control it. I'm going to blot out the sun, lest anybody should gawp at my son dying on the cross. And it couldn't have been an eclipse. It must have been the Lord's doing. And Joel, I, whom I haven't turned you to, time won't permit me to develop that, but it does talk in Joel about the moon being turned into blood. And it talks about the, um, the sun being darkened. And it could, of course, be a reference, and it may well be a double fulfillment, both to the cross and to the final event when the Lord returns. I think, actually, there is room for double fulfillment in these prophecies. Some people think that as... uh, It clearly was a full moon when Jesus died. If you work it out, it was the 14th Nisan, which means it was in the middle of the month, right? The moon starts as a new moon, or the first, and then two weeks later, it's at full. So many people think that the moon would have been rising just as the Lord Jesus died on that cross. Some people have suggested, I can't prove this, that it may have been a blood moon that particular year. But it, so that would fulfill Joel. But also, of course, supernaturally, the sun was put out. And so as the sun was put out, suddenly the moon becomes visible. It's a, a sort of a, Well, only later, sort of just as he's come to the end, right? And as the sunset emerges, then the sun, the moon comes up. Quite remarkable, but what? look, there were signs. They were there for signs. And the sun, moon, and stars are there for signs. The glorious truth, though, is that Jesus Christ both made those stars, supports those stars... And he died on the cross that we might be forgiven. And he is the one that we should be worshipping today. Those stars should make us think of Christ and should make us draw close to worship him the more. May the Lord bless you as we've considered the stars together. I know that I haven't answered all your deep questions I I won't be able to answer them all. I don't know all the answers. All I know is what the scriptures really tell me. And that's what I build my whole understanding of the universe on. The whole understanding of creation. Stick to six-day creation. Don't move from that. Don't move into these gap theories and all this idea of trying to fit evolution into the Bible. It doesn't work, guys. Stick to what the scriptures say. And the Lord will bless this church enormously. You already are being blessed. May you go on to blessing after blessing after blessing as more young people are gathered in and saved and brought under the ministry of Andrew and others here at the church. May God bless you all. Shall we pray or do you want to pray, Andrew? It's Okay. I'm coming here so that uh, those who've... Uh, been listening online can hear better gracious God we thank you so much for your word we are truly awe inspired as we look at the stars but we're even more awe inspired when we consider what your word says particularly about the end when the stars will fall from heaven when you will roll up the whole of the host of heaven like a garment We are made, Lord, to be really humbled. And Lord, as we see our leaders strutting around with no reference at all to God in their thinking, it really concerns us, Lord, that even our church leaders, Lord, the national leaders, are not acknowledging thee and are not drawing us to consider Christ. Lord, we think back to those days in the Second World War when we were on our knees. I was not there, of course, but in my parents' generation, they heard King George VI call the nation to prayer, not just once, but many times. And Lord, we seem to be so far removed from those days. So far have we sunk as a nation. Oh, gracious God, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, as a nation. We've killed our innocent children in the womb by the million. We've denied thee, we've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness, as Romans 1.18, 1 
warns us against. And Father, we have, we have despised your name. Even as a church, we haven't stood up. Lord, we haven't declared your word as we should. Lord, we humble ourselves before thee and we say, Lord, forgive us and cleanse us and wash us from our sin. Help us to rise up in the power of Christ, in the power of the word of God. Bless, Lord, the leaders here of this church. Bless Andrew, bless Martin. Bless others here, Lord, who are involved in leadership. Encourage them. Thank you for their stand for truth. And may, Lord, this church at Red Ruth and many of the churches down here in Cornwall resound to the word of God mighty, mightily. And may, Lord, many be drawn to Christ, we pray. There have been revivals in Cornwall in the past. There have been revivals in this, this uh, wonderful part of the country. And we pray, gracious God, there will be revivals again. Lord, it may just be that you'll bring revival to our dark land even again. And Lord, in your mercy, please, would you do so? Would you revive us in the north of England? We long, Lord, for rich blessing. We long, Lord, for people to come in their hundreds to pack the doors of our churches again and the pews and to listen to the preached word of God. Please, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' great name and for his glory. Amen.